We are, however, in control of how we respond and react to the outcomes and the circumstances that we're in. That's actually our responsiveness is the outcome we should be looking for. So how that informs, I think, strategy, brand strategy of the future is understanding between agencies and clients, by the way, I think it's a reciprocal thing, is understanding that while we are not in control of the environment, we are in control of our agility and ability to respond to the status quo. Welcome to The Lead Creative, where we talk to the creative minds behind some of the leading brands, businesses, organizations, and top ideas that we all love. Our chats range from building brands, conceptualizing new products, strategy, and building businesses. I'm your host, Monge Zimtati. Marketing, advertising, and brand communication strategy have evolved rapidly over the years. As consumers, we very rarely get to know what goes on behind the scenes, how the people behind some of our most favorite brands think, why they come up with some of the ideas that they do, and what makes some of these strategies the very best, and why some don't even resonate. To help us get a glimpse into the thinking of strategists, it is an honor to be joined by senior marketing communications strategist, Dumi Rabanye. She has over 17 years experience as a marketing communication strategist. Her past roles include being strategic director at the Brave Group. She also switched roles recently, stepping into product management in the telco space. Dumi Rabanye, welcome to The Lead Creative. Whoa, cool. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much, Mongezi. Thank you for making the time. I'm excited to get some of your insights on strategy. I think to start, Dumi, having been a freelancer, cutting your teeth in agencies and brands, what makes a compelling strategy? That's a deep question. So, <laughs> so I think what I've learned what I've learned over time about, about strategy is the power of consistency. And I think that th- that consistency is grounded in two critical things, intent as well as purpose. So you see some of the most in- enduring kind of um, work coming from the original intent of the business. In fact, I just had a conversation with a client recently hmm that I found completely refreshing. It, it's, a, it's a food product. It's a convenience meal, if I can call it that, that is highly nutritional and priced at a very premium point. Yeah, priced for, for the premium market. And it was lovely to hear the founder say, okay, so for retail purposes and to get the product out there, we've done the job. But in all reality, I am not satisfied with where the brand is because it was never intended for the premium market only. Yeah. So now that we have the means, I want to go back to the drawing board and possibly fulfill the purpose of this this brand and this product's existence. I thought that was quite powerful because he's true to the purpose and the intent and willing to adjust in order to go back to their reason for being. Out of that, I'm also getting a sense of the fact that the brand owner or the brand also needs to almost come to the table with their own, call it vulnerability, with their own sense of, I don't know enough and I hand this over to you as an expert in your field to help me take the brand message forward from this point. And therein lies the power, I think. Everything that you've just said is actually more than ever now where we are, that's definitely pronounced. What I found refreshing, by the way, about the, about that client was the willingness to say, I need to get back to basics and get back to where I wanted to be, hence reaching out, you know, to to an advisory panel, if I can call it that. I hear you. You also mentioned consistency and the, this word, this term comes up quite a bit. And there's one side of consistency where the brand messaging is consistent with, you know, with 
the intent of the brand or the intent is sort of consistent with the messaging. There's also consistency in the sense of when the brand is out in the market, or at least a product is out in the market, not necessarily the brand. When the product is out in the market, it needs to be consistent with the brand messaging. So where does that fine thread lie? Like what's the significance of that thread and how do you know that you're hitting it? Um, Here's what's powerful about where we are. How you know that you are hitting the right chords in the place where we are right now is we are not short of information, data, feedback. Yes, yes. The, you know, and every time I use formal words like the advent of social media, it's, it's highly irritating because it makes it seem like it's this thing that's removed from us. Mm. But now more than ever, it's second nature for consumers to give you their feedback. And so that's how you know whether you're striking the chord or not. And then when you haven't struck the chord, how do you redirect? How do you recalibrate? How do you become more relevant? We are not short of information. We're not short of feedback anymore. And it's about listening, I think, in order to get to the place where you originally intended to be. True. I'm going to come back to the, to the I think, the data thing, because that's also, I mean, it's also massive, a massive part on its own, because we get all these data points now. But another place that we find ourselves now as humanity is, of course, the advent of um, COVID-19, right? So mm-hmm. what can brands and strategists take away from this time, this current change in the world, with the presence of COVID-19, social distancing, and all these changes in how brands actually reach out to their audiences. What can we learn from this time? What is this time kind of teaching us um, that we can take away into strategy and into communication with consumers? You know, I, I'm going to self-reference a bit and, and, and hopefully kind of uh, paraphrase the response from that place. So in a conversation, a social conversation today with uh, friends, you know, you'll have the morning check in with yes. the WhatsApp group. How's everybody doing? How's your health? The intent is, is to just see if, you know, people and family members are okay. It's a regular check in. But what I find transpiring consistently is social distancing has dialed up the importance, the need, and the urgency even of emotional connectedness, emotional closeness, right? That's because, powerful. Because, yeah, right? Because the, now more than ever, love's in need of love, right? And so the, I think where brands really have a role to play is finally rising to the occasion, now rising to the occasion, occasion is a term I use, I think, far too frequently. But now more than ever, rising to the occasion of connecting with consumers that otherwise cannot physically get to you. So the framing from marketing science approach and and the Ehrenberg Bass School, and there's talk about how you constantly have to sell and resell to consumers and the notion of, you know, ticking the physical, I mean, in order to win at mental availability or in order to win, you have to have that perfect balance between mental availability as well as physical availability. Sure. Now more than ever, where brands are unable to be physically available in certain spaces, like, for example, the alcohol category, what is the next thing that you can do? How do you demonstrate that you are actually emotionally and mentally connected to your consumers as you are? And perhaps get invited to higher purpose, right? If, by the way, that is the truth of your brand as well. So it's, it's really about finding that, that balance. And I think more than ever, COVID-19 is forcing us to reevaluate what connectedness actually means. Will this time make some brands more relevant than others? Brands that we've loved in the past and brands that have kind of resonated because of this 
inability to to be tuned in emotionally and mentally as you as you kind of put it because this time of any other time at least in in our in this era has made of course some brands slightly less relevant or at least slightly less connected to their you know to their consumers or their customers or brands that they people that they've kind of worked with especially in the b2b space will this change the tides slightly you think i think it's already happened <laughs> i think they're like like a couple of really prime examples we went from not knowing zoom to completely yes. like n- now we are discussing zoom mm-hmm. right we we are like as in the three options presented to meet up with people yes are zoom google google hangouts or google meets or microsoft teams right and, there and, and and very and very interestingly um whatsapp as well right whatsapp mm-hmm. video calls right? have also become so very powerful i just i just saw these uh features by the way um so um Facebook has launched the the conferencing feature as well. So you create a room yes, yes. and you're able to connect with people. Then they've also extended it to WhatsApp, where you have the option to create a room via WhatsApp that then connects your users via Messenger that such that you don't necessarily need a number, but they need to be available on Facebook. The other feature that they've also launched is uh, the QR code in your profile yes. settings such that yes. anyone that is looking for you can now identify you via your QR code whether they have your mobile number or not now this is all around product right and product yes. development yeah yeah, okay? yeah so to bring it back to the brand discussion these brands i think have used the equity of their brands to actually provide solutions that are even more relevant to consumers now an example of a lesser known brand that actually led in terms of launching this 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 offering would be house party but we've completely yes. gone and forgotten about it but also another another even bigger brand that used to be synonymous with video calls or Skype, right? Nobody talks about Skype today <laughs> as much as they talk about Zoom. In fact, it's we talk a... about it as an outdated option. Exactly. Exactly. Even when you're doing your business calls, it's like it's like, oh gosh, Skype really? Yes. Wait, yes. then I have to yeah. download and like you it's just not easy. It's just not agile enough. Mm. And I think it answers my question about the how some brands can become obsolete in a time of need to people and this connectedness that you refer to. Absolutely. So here's another example just referencing I suppose the world I've just come from. When last actually did you really think about telecom or telecom mobile? And it's it's not about even playing into the fixed line space. Yes. Right? I'm not even talking about that brand. I'm talking about telecom mobile. Mm. So when last were we thinking about telecom or telecom mobile? Like no i think we don't and again i'm very wary of of i think being in a uh, sort of position of somewhat slight privilege i guess where yes. to me i'm almost network agnostic so it doesn't matter whether you are that's, a telecom and mtn or ever else i just want to be connected that's exactly it right so the rest of the right mobile networks are actually still talking to the consumer about the products that they have on offer yes and getting to a place of for lack of a better description getting to a place of ubiquity right it goes without saying you it's second nature to think about well i need to get airtime i need to top up therefore you defer to a mobile network but in yeah. the in the spectrum of conversations around mobile networks there's a network that's got more capability possibly from a bulk point of view than any other but we're not talking about them anymore probably because they they're doing such a half big job of talking to us so you're seeing more and more you know some businesses becoming obsolete 
some brands, I mean, uh, becoming obsolete in the context of the time that we are in. What I think yes. COVID is doing is it's accelerated that. It yeah. is like the curtain has been pulled on the lack of innovation and agility on certain brands and others. And that's, so that's, that's very, yeah, that's fascinating and powerful. I mean, I'm seeing it in, uh, in some businesses that I also interact with where the, the rate of technology adoption has been accelerated and yes. also the communication behind this also needs to be accelerated because yes. there's also the work of education that needs to go on in the yes. back. Yes, absolutely. And how very interesting that the time that we're in now, right, the confluence of brand, product, and the education around both of this is now more urgent than ever. It's the difference between your brand becoming a verb or not. I always use that as my litmus test, you know, for the success of a brand. I always say, like, when your brand becomes the verb, in my view, that is the apex of success. Because people defer to your brand to explain the action they are taking, yes, the like behavior. Googling. We are Googling, we are WhatsApping, uh, yes. we, are, uh, we are FaceTiming, we are you know, uh, Facebooking. Yes. We're not social networking. This is we, true. We are, we are, yeah, we're Facebooking. We're yeah. tweeting. Yeah, true, true. Yeah. Just to, just to turn things a little bit um, towards a different direction. Your bio reads the only constant these days is disruption. Can you unpack what that means for brands? Can you unpack what that means for even for creative strategy? Sure. I, I read a really powerful piece of reading, a thought piece released by McKinsey a while back. And it was referring to the agile companies of the future. And it was kind of articulating what the company of the future looks like, behaves like, in order to become sustainable. And it was contextualized around the fourth industrial revolution, right? Mm. What was interesting is this fourth industrial revolution, at least in maybe my point of view then from my vantage uh, point was it was this thing that was coming yes you know it was coming to you you were not in it yet it was mm. still coming yes and then this term disruption is used often in association with the fourth industrial revolution and we refer to the role of technology we we talk about disruption and technological disruption yes right Disruption by its nature, that word and the meaning thereof infers momentary, like a, it's an occasion, right? So we're placidly like having a conversation and then inverse my daughter and she disrupts our conversation and she's going to then exit the room. Now, yes. here we are. We are in a state of dis disruption now mm, and it's permanent every <laughs> right <laughs> every single day and the acronym vuca actually des describes i think more aptly what the so-called disruption is volatile yes. unpredictable complex and ambiguous times yeah as it turns out it's not an occasion it's the way of life today, taking it back to brands, to strategy, and the importance for me of that McKinsey reading was mm. actually recognizing why agility now more than ever needs to be prized, right? Over control, for example. The yes. reality is that we are not entirely in control of the outcomes yeah. We are, however, in control of how we respond and react to the outcomes and the circumstances that we're in. That's actually our, our responsiveness is the outcome we should be looking for. So how that informs, I think, brand strategy of the future is understanding between agencies and clients, by the way, I think it's a reciprocal thing, uh, is understanding that while we are not 
in control of the environment. We are in control of our agility and ability to respond to the status quo. COVID-19, prime example. Yeah. It literally feels like, um, you know, you've seen the memes. The, you know, the memes will go, there you are in January, you know, on the 31st of December, going into the 1st of January, going cheers. None of us had any idea what was coming in March. Absolutely. In yeah. mid-March, okay? Everything shut down. And we were just like, what the hell just happened? We, it felt like we were naughty kids that had been mm. grounded because we weren't watching the news. Yes. And even when we were watching the news, this thing was in Wuhan, man. It wasn't, yeah, it didn't affect Yeah, it was in Wuhan. In it, fact, where's Wuhan? You know, like, oh, it's in China. Ah, it, It's got nothing to do with us. Well, here we are. Yes, true. Here we are. True. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Once you've grounded yourself in purpose, also, I said this in a previous talk, the deployment of that purpose in short-term, in bite-sized chunks, so that all those pieces of, all those bites, bite sizes, mm. add up to a bigger whole, right? A greater, a greater offering. It's like pieces on a puzzle. Yes. You need all of the pieces together in order to get the full picture. Yeah. Um, brands no longer have the option of rocking up as a full picture and then walking the consumer backwards and saying, yeah, remember, I told you I was great. Remember. Yes, yes, yeah. Now, great is a, is a behavioral daily discipline and commitment, bit by bit especially in the face of the challenges that we face on a daily basis. And speaking of puzzle pieces, um, Dumi, and, 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 and almost piecing things together for the consumer, we now have near endless data points on consumers, but brands still get their communication wrong. How can we use data effectively so that people and the industry, I guess, don't sing for their lunch so that, you know, you don't see more people singing for their lunch in an ad or the agency having to, having to prove its worth in a brand space. If you're enjoying The Lead Creative, please take a moment to share this episode with your network. Please hit subscribe or follow this podcast to get our latest episodes. Enjoy the show. You know, I had a very interesting, I went through a very interesting exercise right now while I was preparing for our discussion. I was looking at examples of like ads and campaigns that I thought, oh, okay, this is so cool, okay? And then I was struck immediately by the range in duration of the creative examples that I was seeing. I went online, I went on to Ad Week, and I looked at uh, a couple of campaigns. And you know what? One of the first things that I noticed is how long it took for me to get to a 30-second spot. Because maybe the 30-second spot is no longer as premium as a piece of uh, content that can yes. sit online and it's the three-minute movie. Yeah. Right? Yeah. That you view on your device, on your Wi-Fi. And, mm. and I understand that the lens I'm wearing is, is somewhat elitist in that, like you've said, you know, I live in a connected home and I have the power of internet and I, you know, I, I, I'm not consumed by the cost of data so yes. much as what I'm able to do with the uncapped data that I have. But I noticed what that must imply for media buying immediately, you mm. know? And I also then went back to just for me as a consultant and what my clients are requesting more and more of me. My clients are no longer requesting big, high polluted strat presentations. They want me to get into the execution where before I had the privilege and the benefit of going to my media planner in order to brief them. And then they strategize and then, or the media strategists, then they strategize and together we come in and we bamboozle the client. And then it is rolled out into the media plan. My clients are coming to me and saying, listen, hi, to me. I only have an hour. This is the cap of my budget. Yes. I want to get from point, point A to point C 
within this time frame, with this budget, what can you do for me? And I can no longer afford to be theoretical. Hmm. In order to stop being theoretical, sorry, Mangi, in order oh, to stop sure. being theoretical, guess what's helping me? The data. Yeah. But also, I think, I mean, the, the other thing in agreement with you, what I've also noticed is that not only is there a change in just the 30 second spots, which by and large was a thing for TV with, with more mediums taking on more content and, and, and thereby having to create more media for more mediums. Yeah. The, the, the restriction of a 30 second spot is almost, has almost disappeared. I mean, I, I saw an ad the other day doing the rounds and going viral on social media by chicken licking. And I think it was 60 oh. seconds, or 90 seconds right. or whatever it was. And it was a longer story, only parts of which you would see if you are watching, um, you know, a terrestrial TV channel. And also the fact that you can now spread your media out that much more. I, to I was actually going to say the, consumer. the power for me of that work and even the media investment in, in buying for the 30-second spot was launch. Launch, high impact, see the, the piece, see the story, and very quickly digitize it because that work, to reference my music world, that work is highly piratable. You, you can't help yourself, right? Mm. It's so refreshing. It's so funny. It strikes so many chords that you want the clip as soon as possible so that you can forward it. Yes. yes. Now Chicken Licken is investing in a healthy creative budget. Yeah. That who, whose media will travel all on its own because we will make it travel. And if you look at the script, actually, the script is actually a montage of South African moments during COVID that we can all relate to. When you put saliva on the paper, the mask going wrong, the international accent that, that's uh, appreciating South Africanisms, the Englishization of our, our colloquial terms, the fact that we are seeing this on mainstream, everything about it is magical, right? Yes, yes. So we can't help ourselves. Like, why bad? Like, oh, you can't believe it happened. So you yeah. want to share it with other people. There, exactly, exactly. Winning, winning, winning formula. Yeah. On another note, um, with the with data um, as well. I mean, more and more data right now is pointing to Black Lives Matter, to inequality and other injustices in society. What role can brands play in this sensitive time? I mean, one of the things that I'm seeing is that some brands are either apprehensive towards releasing certain types of content. Some feel as though they are being negatively attacked because, because the, the, the thinking is that it's such a volatile time right now, as though it's an era that has just begun and it will, the wave will pass. Can brands play a role in, in um, reframing their thinking and being part of a positive narrative during this time? I, we were having this discussion in one of the um, ad focus conversations and the question that was posed is going dark. You know, certain brands are responding to the state of affairs by going dark and kind of staying quiet and circumspect for a bit mm. and really saying as little as possible, uh, waiting the storm out, so to speak. But for me, that's a that's a that's rather contrarian and almost like counterproductive. Hmm. If we have just agreed that these are VUCA times, volatile, unpredictable, complex, and ambiguous times, hmm, if that's our reality, should you as a brand not be recalibrating to be relevant to the times that we are in? And then going back to some of the movements and themes that you cited, if we look at the power of media, if we look at the power of technology and as demonstrated through social media, and I think now more than ever, digital broadcasting, news travels faster today than it ever has. Yes. And so 
in my observation, certain expressions and certain life experiences uh, develop a coining, a framing, a label faster than ever because there's a collective consciousness, awareness, and acknowledgement of the state of affairs. Yes. And very quickly, audiences, users, consumers, customers, name that experience. So it's not that it's new, is that now we have a name for it, mm. right? And so if brands don't recognize the agency of its consumers right now in articulating what they're going through, they miss the opportunity to have the relevant conversation with their consumers. So what, what role can brands play? Well, you know, a brand is, the descriptor for a brand is the sum total of your identity, absolutely, your, so, the, so the physical assets, as in the aesthetic assets, as well as the actions that are based on its intent. And for me, silence on issues is an absolute revelation of the brand's intent. And unfortunately, even silence from the perspective of consumers yes. is in itself an action. So whether you deliberately say something and you say something purposeful, positive, that contributes, or you say nothing, your audience is watching you. Yes, and and and, and that in, and invariably, yeah, way, right? in, invariably you've said something. Yeah, you know, and so the gap for me is in ownership. Own it. Own your action. Own your action, especially in a in a, in a place and time of democratized media, where your your audiences, consumers know they have a voice, and they're not yes. afraid to present it to you if they feel that you are listening. You had better make sure as a brand that you are there and ready to engage in a conversation. Sure. It's, it's, but, but it's difficult because, I mean, in, uh, again, the brand communication, sometimes like budgets almost work in cycles, right? It's very cyclical. So you wouldn't, again, not having been able to predict COVID-19, you also would not have predicted the growth and development and conversations around certain movements and injustices coming up, how do you then even begin to show some kind of accountability and ownership of your actions? How do you, know, you integrate that into your strategy? You know, Mongezi, I want to challenge the you wouldn't have been able to anticipate. If you think about the power of media, digital media, the internet. Yes. It goes as far back, actually, as the Twin Towers. True, yeah. We were sitting here in South Africa. I remember it so clearly. I, I missed, I, I was late for class because I couldn't believe what was, what was like, what I was seeing on my television screen. It was one of those box TVs with, you know, that the, the big box TVs. Yeah, with basically. a massive fan at the back. Right, <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. And I, I remember coming out to check if, like, has anyone else seen this? Is this a prank? And I remember because I was going to politics class. And I couldn't. I, I couldn't move. Right? And guess what? When I went into class, somebody else was late along with me. And we were just like, oh, what just happened? Mm. Okay. Literally, we disrupted the conversation. When I say we disrupted, I mean, like... It's not just a, a disruption in the, in the militant stance. It was just like, okay, listen, did anyone else see what we just saw? Like the, yes. the Twin Towers were bombed <clears throat> in the US. And this is, it was instantly a global phenomenon, like yeah. instantly. I think about the Arab Spring. What did we learn from the Arab Spring that you, you could predict this, the, I want to call it, scalability sometimes the scalability yes. of movements yeah we think about an event for me that's very close to my heart here in south africa the prospect of nelson mandela's passing yes. you know in my insomniac state 
I was just kind of browsing the news and there was the ongoing critical but stable, you know, uh, uh, narrative. Yeah. Narrative. And literally, you know, I was on CNN, I remember. I was watching CNN in the middle of the, in the night and on came Barack Obama in like the most circumspect voice. Yes. My television was on mute for heaven's sake because I had an infant. Mm. Do you know? I knew the second I saw his face, what had happened. The very first thing that I did was reach out to friends at that time. Because this was not local news. Because yes. media, media had broken it, its locality. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I, I had a, a, a driver from uh, Italy that had ferried me around when I was on holiday. And we, he, he had my details. I promise you, that's where the first message came from. I remember he, he sent me a message saying, I just saw the news of Nelson Mandela's passing. How are things in South Africa? Now, hmm. are we serious in saying we can't predict? <laughs> we can't predict the scalability of news. We can't yeah. predict the scalability of crises and how they affect us collectively. I think, I mean, to your point, it's, it's right, there's... Uh, there's Another side to this narrative, which is um, especially now, right? I mean, yeah. the, the very significant issues that you mentioned now, in their own right, as 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 isolated, almost isolated events in the media, in some way could have been predicted. And I think um, South Africa had prepared for the news of former President Nelson Mandela's passing and it's something that was I think prepared for but the other side of this narrative that I want to feel like I should point out is the fact that sometimes there were we act as though something is a movement that affects brands when at that time it's become a bit of a voracious issue in the media whereas yes. inequality and the negative behavior and the dark behavior has been happening in the background anyway and yes. no one standing up until it becomes an issue in the media right then that's looking as though it affects brands it affects society it affects but it this. does it, it, or, it does it you know here's has. what i'm saying I, i'm saying is it always has right it's just yeah. that it's in the media now but it was affecting society anyway right and so and so for me um, what I'm saying, and, and, and to be fair, the yeah. examples I cited are all, you know, news, current affairs and, and, and PR driven, right? Yeah. But in reality, they're also reflective of the temperament of the society at, at a given point. They re they're reflective of what consumers are going through at a given point. Now, for me, the role of the brand then and where it plugs in yes. is finding a space of relevance within that that conversation mm -hmm. um and the i think the difference between the brands that stand the test of time and the ones that don't are the, like the brands that are able to locate themselves within the conversation they they're able to stick it out sure you know find a point of view stick it out and see it to the other side and as it turns out, by the way, when that other side is is done, another side reveals itself. Because That's actually, true. as it turns out, life is a is a kaleidoscope yeah. of sides. Not you know, I don't even know if I use the right example there, but life is a kaleidoscope. Uh, you look at Nike, for example, and how they have consistently responded and acted in light of race, gender, you know, and and by by just that sheer creativity that's matched with a intelligence, Nike has assumed a position of thought leadership and authority. They're not, you know, they're not a sneaker brand anymore. Yes. They are, they are cause related brand. They are purposeful brand in a tangible kind of way. I think about, Ooh, 
I was watching an execution just now, actually, uh, by Apple that I think was released on the 13th of July. And it's a reflection on the reality behind all of our video calls. And it is hilarious because each one of us can relate. We are those characters. Yes. You know? And I think that's the, that's the power of brand. Brand doesn't exist in, in a vacuum all of its own. Brand exists within a society. And yeah, and, and it's also in many aspects, especially when you look at brands on social media, it's seen as a person, right? It's seen as human in Absolutely. some way. How it acts. Absolutely. Absolutely. So you mentioned um, at Focus, and mm-hmm. I, I can't let you leave without us talking about that a little bit. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm happy to. So as jury chair of the Ad Focus Awards in a time when advertising has taken a knock, has the role of the industry changed, you know, in, in, in what it stands for now? And also, I think the idea of awards and gathering in a space. <laughs> so, I mean, this is my daily conversation, right? And I think for me, it's quite ironic, actually, that someone like myself would be chosen, I think, for a role like this. But it's also very fitting in, in this way. I think by nature as a person and as a straight person, certainly, um, critique and, and self-analysis or analysis is natural. It's second nature for me, right? But the end to which the critique is necessary is really what matters the most. Yes. And I think I, along with the previous chairperson, are a reflection of the desperate, maybe desperate is negative, but anyway, uh, the urgency of change and transformation demonstrated in the industry, sure. especially in South Africa. I'm going to take that myopic view a little bit, especially in South Africa, where transformation is referred to in the black, white aesthetic terms. Yes. is actually something quite critical. Mm-hmm. I look at myself and I look at my, you know, my, my predecessor and we represent the majority of the workforce in South Africa today in the sense that we are black women. Mm-hmm. We also represent, and I'm not even saying this as, a, as an activist stance, it's yes. just reality statistically. Yeah. There's yeah. more and also, of us. also, and yeah, there's absolutely, and 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 at the same time, the vocal women in the industry are not adequately represented either, right? Exactly, right. And also, by the way, what what does that you know vocal mean? Vocal as a posture? Is it vocal as in using my voice? Is it vocal as in marking my presence? You know, like I think beyond I the denotation. It, I see it as both, I think. I mean, I see it as both in the sense that as far as I know you, you are both your voice and your presence in the industry. Right. Right. So, so, and arguably black people in the South African um, space in that way in the industry are not represented, more so black women. Right, right. And what's critical for me is just in in my own presence, and not to not to I specialize it too much, is is also the the urgent demonstration of diversity, but also the urgent demonstration of movement, as opposed to pontificating about what needs to happen. Yes, sure. Right. And so you asked a very pertinent question around the role of awards. And, you know, referring back to this role with Ad Focus, I think there's, there's something interesting, intriguing, purposeful, action orientated in fashioning a relevant, moving, growing awards offering. Another juror asked me this question and, and really forced me to think. They were like, what, like, what was the purpose of all of these awards? Like, if you think about it, like, 
they all cost something in terms of entering. Is this not the time where we should be looking at aggregating certain awards offering? Do we not have too many such that, you know, we're losing kind of distinction or we're losing aspiration in the offerings that are present? And so the one way to get to that destination, I think, is to put in the work, to put in the thinking work, to put in the evolution work, to put in the the refinement work on a very, very personal level. Mm. I was ex- especially excited about getting on board this role at this time because of the challenge that it poses. The first thing that I was told is, okay, so we are not stopping, we're carrying on, we're going virtual. And it was like, what? We are going virtual? Yes, let's do it. (laughs) Why? Because the, the compartment, it completely opened up for me is to embrace the opportunity to bring in global thinking and global minds, you know? So I could picture and fathom an ad focus awards that's able to source a South African creative that is now based elsewhere in the world to contribute to this conversation. I could fathom... Because uh, because work, the creative work in many ways, in many respects, should stand up to its global contemporaries. And then I just wanna I just wanna share with you this. I love that you defaulted to creative work and laddering up to global contemporaries. What is powerful about ad focus is creative is the evidence thereof. What matters though is the business sustainability. This is about business excellence. Now, an excellent business prides itself on being able to succeed at a couple of other metrics, a couple of other indicators. Mm -hmm. So the COVID-19 Adaptability Award, for example, that we have is one that is relevant to the time that we're in now. We've created a special um, category that looks at how agencies and clients and in their partnership have been able to collaborate in order to weather the storm that is COVID. If you think about the window, then the the purview that we'd be looking uh, from, it's actually really in earnest from March until now. But what have brands and their agencies done? How have their staff been empowered to work virtually? Are there systems that they put in place in order to keep the lights on? And if the lights haven't been kept on, You know, I've spoken with a couple of business owners who are literally at the tail end of the survival of their business. And the thing that can make the difference between their ability to pivot or not is just putting together this case study. I spoke with a business owner that was just like, oh, my gosh, I actually hadn't thought about that. Hmm. But of course, we've shrunk, but we're still here. Yes. In writing yes. The, the, the submission, the case study, I actually felt proud where I felt quite depressed. Yeah. You know, as my budgets were cut, I spoke with another business owner who is like, oh my gosh, I didn't realize it mattered that I had repurposed. You know, it mattered that I'd created another uh, offering within my business that was going to allow me to retain all my staff. So I haven't retrenched. And that's a success story. And the creative is... The beautiful stuff. Yes, yes, yes. The, the the most the most important thing is that the business, as you've as you've uh, as you've said that you know when you started out with this yeah. part of the discussion that you need to excel in many other places as well. The creative is one of those metrics. Absolutely, um, absolutely. Do me, thank you, thank you. I think I mean I know that you and I can go on. We can. For much longer. Thank you for listening to The Lead Creative. Did you get one insight that's worth sharing from this episode? Please share it with a friend or anyone who might like it. Pop me some of your ideas and innovative finds on Twitter at Mongezi. This podcast is available on Spotify, Stitcher, Google, Apple, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. This podcast is also hosted on iAfrican.com forward slash radio. 
You can find me and more of my content on mongezi.com.